Good afternoon, sirs, ma'ams, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Raj Patel, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Um, as Tim's mentioned there, I work as the SO2 in charge of aeromedical evacuation at the UK Aeromedical Evacuation Control Centre based at RF Bryce Norton. This is a large air transport base and the air transport hub for the Royal Air Force. I'd also like to pay acknowledgement and thanks to Wing Commander Ed Nicholl um, for use of certain slides and his help throughout this presentation. So first of all, a question just to start off with, um, just to see what we're going to learn. Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, that's what I'd like to talk about today and its aeromedical implications, um, using a case to highlight that. So first of all, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, is it a bacterial illness of the streptococcal family? Does it have a mortality of 30%? Is it preventable with prior immunisation? Is it common in Northern Europe? Or all of the above? I'll let you think about that and we'll come back to that at the end. Okay. Good. Right, okay. Um, so scope of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, a brief presentation on, first of all, an uh, overview of the UK aeromedical evacuation system, then using a case example of a case of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, its aeromedical evacuation and the use of the air transportable isolator, then the aeromedical risk assessments that went along with that transportation, and then any questions in the panel discussion afterwards. So brief overview, um, the United Kingdom provides an aeromedical evacuation service. It's a 24-hour uh, service, seven days a week, 365 days a year. In 2011, we undertook uh, evacuation from over 100 different countries around the globe. Here's some chronological figures just showing the numbers of aeromedical evacuations which have occurred over the years, which have unfortunately been increasing through recent conflicts. 2012, we evacuated just over 4,500 patients in that year which fortunately had dipped from the preceding year where we were just over 5,000. Hopefully that's a continued trend downwards. The organisation of aeromedical evacuation within the UK. The policy of aeromedical evacuation is exercised through the Deputy Assistant Chief of Staff Aviation Medicine, which is an OF5 rank held at the Centre of Aviation Medicine. Implementation of aeromedical evacuation is through the Deputy Assistant Chief of Staff for Medical Operations and Plans, another OF5 rank based at HQ Air Command at RF High Wycombe. Thereafter, coordination of aeromedical evacuation is passed to myself through the Aeromedical Evacuation Control Centre at RF Bryce Norton. How we undertake AE. A patient anywhere in the world, or rather their attendant, will probably ring up our office, send a signal, or communicate via email um, highlighting their patient requirement and the need for a movement. Um, we then receive this request within the UK AECC based at Bryce Norton where we make an aeromedical risk assessment. We then determine the appropriate aeromedical evacuation team based on the clinical needs of that patient, what aircraft are available. The UK have no dedicated aeromedical air, uh, evacuation platforms therefore we try to use aircraft of opportunity where available or the, and the ground logistics associated with that move as well. So let's go into case history. This was a case that occurred in just October last year. Um, this was a 38-year-old male, recently returned from a trip from Afghanistan. He was a civilian. He'd become unwell on a flight returning from Afghanistan via Dubai and on his way to Glasgow in Scotland, which is at the north. He'd had symptoms of viral illness, and on flight and on the ground had symptoms of hemoptysis and gastrointestinal bleeding. As it deteriorated significantly, upon landing in the UK, he went to the nearest hospital and was admitted to a hospital in Glasgow, which is up in Scotland. 
He developed symptoms of spontaneous bleeding within his calf, and blood tests showed a mildly raised white cell count, a low platelet count of six, positive D-dimer tests, norm, relatively normal clotting. His liver function was significantly deranged, but he had a normal renal function. An initial differential diagnosis was made at this time of either Lassa or typhoid fever. However, he continued to deteriorate with bleeding gums and a reduced Glasgow coma scale. At that time, the infectious diseases consultant treating him suggested viral hemorrhagic fever as a possible cause, and whilst it was a low risk, they still needed to exclude conditions such as Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Bloods were taken and tested at the reference laboratory in Porton Down, and un unfortunately and to surprise, tested positive for Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. This was the first positive case in the UK. As in line with the national protocol, it was recommended that he was transferred to the High Security Infectious Diseases Unit, which is based at the Royal Free Hospital, um, which is down in London. And as you can see from the map on the left-hand side of the slide, um, Scotland up in the north, London down in the south, that's over 400 miles by road. This was assessed to be undertaken by ground ambulance, however, they've determined that the road move was probably too risky. It would have been more than eight hours by road with an ambulance crew who would have probably just been wearing personal protective equipment. Therefore, the National Health Service called upon the assistance of the Royal Air Force to assist them with this, as we have a specialised capability of an air transportable isolator. Just to refresh our memories, because I wasn't so sharp on Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever at the time, um, the locations are where you can find this around the world, Asia, Middle, Middle East, and uh, Southeast Europe, but it's rare around there. It belongs to the family of a uh, bunya virus, usually spread by tick bites, aerosol, or contact with slaughtered cattle or sheep. That's quite important in this case. It's usually, um, within humans, it's usually spread through infected um, body fluids or blood contact. It has an incubation period of approximately three to 12 days, and unfortunately a fatality of up to 30%. Symptoms usually are, and signs of severe bleeding and bruising. Treatment, no specific cure, however supportive treatment as for any viral illness, and ribavirin as an antiviral product has been shown to be effective. And again, just to remind, for those who aren't aware of the RAF's air transportable isolator, many other countries have an air transportable isolator or that type of capability. Effectively, this is a, I suppose the simplest way is a large plastic bag in which the patient's kept and then air circulated around to maintain a barrier between the external environment and the internal environment. The ATI has a, a circulation of air of 58 cycles per hour. It works on a negative pressure principle with two HEPA filters and it's been used on five live deployments since 1985, so infrequently used. However, it's in, operated in conjunction with the Department of Health within the United Kingdom. There's a picture of it and an exercise in our C17. Some of the risk assessment factors that I'd like to talk about are first of all clinical, logistics, ethical, financial and of course media as can be seen here on the BBC World News. So clinical first of all, this patient was deteriorating rapidly. From receiving the call we had probably less than 24 hours to act and get this patient to their destination. It was unlikely that if this mission wasn't completed in 24 hours, he probably wouldn't have survived and therefore it wouldn't have been worth undertaking this mission. So we had to act urgently and in line with the NATO classifications, classed him as a priority one era medical evacuation. He was beyond the capability of the treating hospital. The hospital he was at was getting to the point that they were finding it very difficult to manage him. They had difficulties in testing his blood any further. The high infectivity of his blood meant the lab staff were unable or unwilling to test his own blood in that environment. Um, and the hospital just weren't able to dispose of his waste products safely or securely. From a fitness to fly perspective, this guy was deteriorating quickly. He wasn't really fit to fly in any state, but then we had to balance that out as well. The team who went out to assess him needed to optimise him at that time with their AVMED knowledge and optimise him pre-flight with the blood transfusions and also ribavirin to try and delay any disease progress. The ATI has a team composition of nine medical type personnel, a mixture of nurses and RAF medics. 
However, to augment that team and specific for this mission, we also added on a consultant in infectious diseases, a consultant physician and a critical care consultant to maybe aid with the decision making processes and also how to manage this rare condition. Due to the environment he was in within the air transportable isolator um, and this patient's and for the safety of the crew in the aircraft, this patient wasn't for cardiopulmonary resuscitation as it probably would have been futile if he had arrested on flight. Logistics. Again, with any air medical evacuation, this is a big chunk and a big part of um, work to do. Aircraft. As I've said already, we don't have dedicated platforms, therefore we use aircraft of opportunity. There wasn't an aircraft of opportunity at this time, therefore we had to request a dedicated platform for this to happen. A C-130 was made available and we used that. However, there were issues of airworthiness of medical equipment. Um, the air, air transport isolator is partly air cleared, however not fully cleared in this air environment and particularly on this aircraft, so therefore an element of risk had to be taken there. Protection. The air transportable isolator helped isolate that patient from the environment and the individuals were wearing personal protective equipment. However, fortunately this wasn't an airborne infection and this is a lifetime photo down on the bottom left showing the um, protection that the individuals were wearing in terms of simple face masks at that time. The crew and the aeromedical personnel both needed briefing and reassurance as to their own risks so that they could work without panic or fear. Um, of course, doing a mission like this, people worry for their own safety as well as that of the patient. Therefore, again, appropriately reassuring them as to uh, making them aware of their own risk before the mission was equally important. Road transfer. We'd already highlighted that this mission was probably too risky to undertake by road. However, the patient still needed to get to the aircraft and the air transportable isolator was located on or around the aircraft. Therefore, the assistance of the Scottish Resilience Team was required, who effectively wore personal protective equipment and transferred this patient to the aircraft. Um, at the other end, at the receiving destinated, uh, destination airport, again, we have a large aeromedical ambulance which was able to receive the air transportable isolator and take it to its destination hospital, which is used to handling this type of equipment. And again, with any mission, liaison was important, both with the dispatching hospital, the receiving hospitals, road transfer services, police, escorts, clinical teams, health protection agencies and headquarters air. So just a few of the people that we were dealing with at any one time with this mission. Other areas of risk assessment or factors that came into the risk assessment, financial. This wasn't a, a serviceman, this wasn't what the intent of the air transportable isolator was. Therefore we were assisting another government department and re needed in a re reimbursement from this department so financial authority needed to be given first. Ethical. This was another important area. What were we trying to achieve? Um, was this a patient that was going to die and we were just flexing our muscles and doing something which we could do? Or was this actually something that was going to make a difference? After considered opinion, it was decided this was something that was going to make a difference. Again, this was an enhanced risk both to the aeromedical evacuation personnel and the air crew undertaking the mission. This was minimised with training, personal protective equipment and carrying out their um, of their tactics and protocols as they've been taught. There was also a moral obligation to potentially move this patient as this was a national public health issue and again potentially if we hadn't controlled this could have spread around the country further. Media attention. This is something which we hadn't really taken into account however should have and have learnt from. Very quickly this attracted a lot of press interest and it was interesting to see this case which evolved over a 24 hour period which had media teams only two to three hours behind the aeromedical teams at any one point um, and the best way to control this was through media and communications officers delaying and releasing information as and when required rather than press, press trying to um, chase the aeromedical teams around. Whilst the mission was a success and the patient reached their destination as intended 24 hours later, the illness overtook them and the patient unfortunately passed away. Um, there's an interesting photo of, uh, provided by the patient's wife which suggested that the patient probably acquired this illness whilst attending a local wedding in Afghanistan where he'd sla slaughtered a goat and that might have been the likely direct contact of the infected blood source. Okay, so in summary, the key areas to consider, or at least in, with infectious patients um, and aeromedical evacuation, clinical, logistics, ethical, financial and media. Okay, and back to that question at the beginning again. 
So please select one correct answer. Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever <laughs> is a bacterial illness of streptococcal family, has a mortality of 30%, is preventable with prior immunization, is common in Northern Europe, or all of the above. very much. I'll take any questions in the discussion session.